morning everybody good afternoon everybody good evening everybody welcome to the first of our two discussions on our eastern forum which is um, hosted by carnegie europe we've got a great set of panelists and it's supported by eu lisco the eu horizon 2020 program our 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 program is called eu lisco e european union um, limited statehood and contested orders. And it's very timely now because we are actually dealing with Ukraine, Georgia and Belarus, three very, very essential countries that provide security for the region, stability or instability, and they are the European Union's immediate neighbours. We have a great panel and the whole idea about this panel that we're going to try to address a very tricky uh, issue. What are the elements needed to build strong, state and accountable institutions. Very tricky for this part of the world, but very, very necessary. I'll be very, very brief about our panelists. I'm sure many of you, many of you know them. Katerina Zorembo, she's an associate fellow at the New Europe Center in Kiev, Ukraine. And um, very welcome, very nice to have you on, the, on, on our panel, on our virtual panel, Katerina, one day we will meet. And then we have Corneli Kachatia, the director of the Georgian Institute of Politics in Tbilisi, Georgia. Welcome, Cornelia. And we have our person on the ground in, in Belarus, uh, Artyom Sh uh, Shabran. He's a Belarusian political commentator and contributor to Carnegie uh, Carnegie, our Moscow Centre. Welcome to three of you. We've got uh, only one hour, so this is a great chance to be succinct and to pack in as much as possible. And uh, Katrina, I think I'll go to you um, immediately, actually. It's very timely to have you uh, uh, on the panel, because as I mentioned, uh, we're talking about building strong institutions, accountable institutions. We have Corona, we have instability, we've got Eastern Ukraine, we've got Belarus, we've got a lot of unpredictable issues. Um, and of course, um, we are talking just in the wake of yet another dispute over the Anti-Corruption Bureau and how it's going to be organized and run. Could you give us an idea of where we are in, with, with um, the element of building strong institutions now in Ukraine. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Judy, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here tonight. Um, I will say that uh, in the first place, I mean, the, the, the uh, umbrella of our discussion today in the region is the human security. And uh, human security is, uh, uh, I would say, in 2020, uh, more than a buzzword. This is actually an issue which can bring governments in and out of power. And we can say we, we of course, have to measure it uh, rather well with the reliable opinion polling. But uh, I think that uh, the dealing uh, of uh, Lukashenko with the coronavirus also was one of the issues why the people came out to the streets. So this is also about institutions. Um, I would say that uh, for Ukraine, if we talk about Ukraine, uh, again, 2020 is kind of a um, Molotov cocktail of challenges and of insecurities. And if I were to enumerate them, then I would say that in the first place, this is hard insecurity. I will not call security, I'll call it insecurity because this is about a challenge. So hard insecurity in terms of uh, conflict with Russia, in terms of the armed aggression, which goes on in the East and uh, in the uh, occupied Crimea. Uh, so there is continued challenge to Ukraine's territorial so sovereign uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Then there is health insecurity, obviously with pandemic all over the world and in Ukraine specifically, we are still um, waiting for the, uh, or anticipating the uh, second tide, second wave of pandemic, from what, what we can see uh, from the management of the health system and government funds, Ukraine is, uh, se seems not to be prepared for the second tide. And this is what volunteers also confirm. Uh, already now, uh, we can see the reverse figures of the public opinion towards uh, about how things, um, whether things go in the right or wrong direction in Ukraine. Um, there are uh, almost 70% of the people who think that things are going in the wrong direction. And only 20, um, I'm giving rough, rough figures now, uh, who think the opposite. And I think the last year after the presidential election, it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can say that state institutions are not um, fulfilling uh, people's expectations if we look at the public opinion polls. And there is disappointment and, um, and disillusionment maybe. 
Uh, this third level of insecurity is the regional insecurity, and of course, I mean Belarus here. Uh, for Ukraine, this is a big uh, challenge uh, on all matters, starting from the um, uh, from some the stance which Ukraine should take um, upon the uh, result, uh, the the, uh, 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 the result of the um, elections, which was not, which were falsified and not. Uh, uh, confirmed by, by Ukraine, uh, but on the other hand also what to deal with, civil, how, uh, whether Ukraine should provide support to civil society, whether it should side with the international community and which part of it, whether Minsk can remain the city where the Minsk negotiations go ahead. And this, this leads us to the fourth level of insecurity, which I would say the values insecurity. How do you deal with the values of democracy and rule of law when your hard security depends on it? And by this, I mean the um, expectations of Ukraine uh, that Lukashenko will not use, uh, will not allow to use uh, Belarus uh, soil to uh, make any kind of an armed attack on Ukraine from Russia. So all these kind of entangled considerations uh, uh, make a cloud of insecurities around Ukraine and around Ukraine's um, government uh, and authorities uh, who have uh, very some very tough decisions ahead of them uh, and uh, uh, dropping public support. Mm -hmm. uh, to conclude, I would like to say that uh, just last week we had the, the uh, new national security strategy approved. And I think uh, that it's very, uh, on, on many levels and in many regards, it is very professionally formulated. Uh, and I know that it's also approved by a number of experts. Um, how, and, and I also think that it's very human security centered. It's one of the most human security centered documents in Ukraine's history, but whether it remains on paper or in action remains to be seen. That's really interesting, Katarina. Um, a, a very brief question to this excellent, um, succinct presentation. The human security element, um, is it becoming weaker or, um, both the human security and the state institutions, is Belarus a distraction uh, to continue consolidating uh, a kind of human security and the state institutions? Mm. I think that uh, Ukraine in the first place uh, was rather unprepared uh, to the development of the events in Belarus, uh, neither on the state level. So I'm not sure there were kind of scenarios calculated, Ukraine's actions anticipated, uh, nor on the level of uh, civil society or society, just rather society, because if we look at the polls again, we will see that the views are um, very divergent, starting from we have to support uh, Belarus civil society to we have to support Lukashenko to we have to take no sides. And I would say that it's, it's rather reflects um, the, um, the position in the, in, among the state institutions. Uh, so I would say that this is an, just another challenge on Ukraine's plate. How it looks. Well, actually, who was prepared? I mean, look at the mess in the EU uh, on how to deal with, with the post-election uh, falsified results in Belarus. Let's go down to Georgia. Um, uh, Corneli, welcome. Uh, you've heard Katarina give her presentation. Um, human security, human insecurity in Europe's eastern neighbourhood. How does Georgia fit into, into, into this very complicated situation now? Mute yourself. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, I think in case of Georgia, Georgia is unfortunately a classical case where we have a uh, you know prophetic conflicts for uh, already for decades, and of course this uh, affects the human security because we have thousands of IDPs and uh, internal displaced people actually who suffer from this, and especially right now because of COVID-19 uh, and some other, uh, you know, like challenges like social and uh, economical hardship, which uh, actually was brought by COVID. It's also actually also uh, puts this, uh, these people actually in, um, in, in a really uh, difficult situation. Uh, plus um, uh, there's uh, some sort of uncertainties, uncertainties about the uh, future, how Georgia will manage the COVID-19. As you probably know, the Georgia was doing quite well until recently, uh, and it was kind of uh, considered like success story. But uh, I, I think the recent weeks that we had some upsurge with the COVID-19. So 
We don't know uh, how the Georgian government can uh, handle this case because as uh, my colleague from Ukraine managed, I think neither Georgia, neither other uh, Eastern Partnership countries, they don't have the infrastructure to deal with uh, responsibly with the COVID-19 cases. So uh, that's the kind of challenge we have right now. Plus we have also a very uh, delicate situation because we have um, in one month uh, the upcoming parliamentary election, which is which will be very difficult uh, to hold because Georgia doesn't have any, um, how to say, like history to uh, to hold the election during pandemics or something. So this is kind of like open question, how Georgia, Georgian society and the Georgian government and, uh, and generally the population will deal with this such situation, especially if things go worse. Uh, um, uh, is Georgian government and uh, civil society ready, for instance, to postpone the election? I don't think so, uh, because uh, I think that one of the reasons for this is that uh, because of this COVID-19, the Georgian government's popularity went up suddenly. And this is, you can explain with many things, but one of them is rally around the flag effect, which, uh, as you know, in many countries actually helped uh, you know, current uh, ruling parties. So I think that Georgian uh, ruling party also is using this factor. So they want to help this election at the end of October uh, until they enjoy the high popularity. But if things goes worse, uh, then because one month is still uh, quite a lot of time, then it can backfire. So we don't know what will be the result, but all these effects kind of uh, human uh, security and uh, generally the security situation. As far as the um, uh, you know regional dimension, I think we have probably um, um, uh, you know a lot of news there, but most of them related with uh, Russia and the so-called borderization policy, where Russia trying uh, almost like monthly basis basically put uh, these wires uh, back and forth um, in the in, in the uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. So basically, that's a huge challenge for Georgian security, which also uh, influenced the, the Georgia's uh, Euro-Atlantic trajectory in general. Uh, and uh, I think, um, yeah, the, 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 fortunately, there are some, uh, you know, the international actors who are active in the in Georgia soil, including European Union and UMM mission specifically. But uh, unfortunately, there's um, not much uh, that they can influence directly uh, on Russian actions. Hey, Cornelia, can I th thank you for this? Uh this picture, it's, it's for, it, you, you managed to pull in so many things. What's your impression, though? The, you're, you're giving the impression that the state institutions are either not strong enough or they're not prepared enough. Um, my question is, how is, the how is the public being communicated to with regard to a, a second wave? Um, I know. Yeah. You mentioned um, and of course, we have so many IDPs in Ukraine as well. But what's the communication like to the public? Yeah, I think that Georgia was a uh, few months ago, Georgia was considered again as a success story because uh, unlike some other Eastern partnership countries, uh, Georgian government actually communicated through, um, you know, like uh, medics. And uh, there were three or four so-called uh, musketeers who were communicating instead on behalf of the government. And it proved uh, quite successful for some time, uh, but now the things are a little bit changing because uh, it, in one way it was a good uh, tactic because government could, uh, government was not talking directly to the people. And if there was uh, uh, some, you know, bad kinds, uh, some kind of worst kind of scenario, they could blame these doctors. So they were like scapegoats in that sense. But fortunately for them, uh, Georgia proved to be the, uh, you know, uh, kind of positive case for that time. But now with the upcoming second wave, I think things are a little bit, um, we have to be more realistic because we all knew that, uh, you know, Georgian government uh, cannot change the, you know, the, uh, the infrastructures suddenly. Yeah. Of course, they had some time, like two months. Yeah. I don't think that it's enough and uh, uh, God forbid, but uh, in case of the you know, worsening of the situation, I don't think that we are ready for, uh, uh, you know, like, um, uh, pandemic, especially second uh, wave. It's, it's interesting you say this because we go to Artem Shradban in, in Belarus and when Lukashenko denied there was any problem and you, or you just drink vodka and you get rid of this virus, I mean, it was up to the, the citizens to themselves to, to protect themselves. And now we have a situation of, of state institu institutions, coercive institutions against um, citizens and and then, of course, a, a, another second wave, perhaps, of COVID-19 uh, affecting Belarus. Artman, 
it's a it's a very it's a very complex question but you know where are we now in belarus in terms of human security and human insecurity well thank you it's really hard to you know put it all into five six minutes because the events in belarus are i mean literally revolutionary but i mean they are also unprecedented in the country's history i will probably uh, do it from another perspective um, because Belarusian case, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll get into the textbooks uh, of debunking many myths about the capacities of uh, the governments to deal with various crises. Because there is, there was at least this myth, especially in the Eastern Europe, in the post-Soviet space, so to say, that their uh, authoritarian governments are somehow more uh, resilient in terms of dealing with, you know, burning crises. Uh, with uh, sh with sh making decisions quickly, with not uh, spending too much time for domestic, you know, democratic um, deliberations. And Belarus is now is a showcase of why this all is just a myth, uh, that authoritarian, solid, consolidated authoritarian regime failed on many levels, uh, facing various crises uh, in, in course of just one year. And it led to the what, what, what we now observe, which is basically the the collapse of public uh, trust in institutions and also resulting in the collapse of the this dimension that we're talking about of human security uh, because uh, from uh, from the start of the year as you rightly said uh, the Russian regime uh, sort of uh, mishandled it didn't just handle the pandemic is it, it, it completely mishandled the pandemic both in terms of health uh, healthcare side of it because the latest figures from the UN suggest that Belarus had a mortality which is higher than Sweden in terms of mortality rate per capita um, and also in terms of public messaging because it was not necessarily the uh, healthcare crisis that triggered this political crisis but uh, the failures of messaging, the rhetoric that was coming out of Lukashenko's mouth first and foremost that triggered a lot of previously apolitical, apathetic Belarusians to become political and to challenge one of the longest, uh, you know, uh, uh, one, one of the most seemingly stable uh, authoritarian regimes uh, in the whole Eurasian continent. Uh, and um, I think the difference, if we like compare it to Sweden, for example, where the similar strategy of not introducing lockdowns or quarantines was used, is uh, the transparency and the trust uh, because uh, in in countries that also did not have the um, lockdowns or chose another strategy which is unconventional um, which was not putting any restrictions on the on, on, on the movement basically or very few of them governments uh, at least in democratic countries tried to be transparent and honest with their societies about what they do unlike in Belarus where the collapse of public trust, triggered the political crisis. And then what appeared to be the case is that the government faced with the enormous healthcare crisis on its hands, but also economic crisis, uh, because uh, as it you know, was evidently, it was you know, very saliently demonstrated, the lack of lockdown does not save you, does not, does not immune you from economic problems in a globalized world, world where the trade is you know, uh, damaged no matter are your borders open or not because your neighbors close your borders um, from their side. Uh, so the only toolkit, the only tool that authorities had in their you know, toolkit uh, was the brutal crackdown on the dissent. Uh, and the whole electoral campaign in Belarus that lasted for this three months of, of, the, of, of the summer uh, just showed the unprecedented level of crackdown even by Belarusian standards, which, was, which is usually called the last uh, Europe's dictatorship. Uh, and here we are in the seventh week of protests, uh, again, unprecedented in size and, and, and scale, with the elections not just rigged as usual, but rigged on a new qualitative level. Uh, and uh, we see that the mistrust is spilling over from the uh, people does not recognizing the legitimacy of just the uh, supreme leadership, the political authorities, the political establishment, but also to financial institutions. For example, we had a, several weeks of uh, panic on financial market of Belarus currency market, which uh, 
also triggered the National Bank of Belarus to spend over a billion dollars just to keep the currency rate uh, uh, from the rapid devaluation. And uh, getting back to the point, point of risks uh, in terms of foreseeable future, again, this lapse of public trust in governance, in, gov in its government institutions that resulted from the authoritarian nature of the Belarusian government and its inability of government to listen to the people and communicate their policies properly, it leads, it implies the risks of another level comparing to um, our neighbors and, and you know, uh, other countries from the uh, Soviet Union. Because now, for example, in just the course of a, a month, all the foreign policy achievements of Belarus, relative achievements of the last uh, five years are just buried. There is no dialogue with the West anymore. Uh, Lukashenko just refuses even to pick up the phone when uh, Angela Merkel uh, calls. Mm -hmm. Minsk is basically buried as a buried as the place for negotiations, as my colleague from Ukraine has already also mentioned. Yeah. And now the future of Belarus is to a large degree not just in the hands of uh, the Alexander Lukashenko, who uh, is increasingly unpredictable actor, but also Russia is becoming is beginning to play a role that it never played which is basically a veto power on what kind of transition might Belarus, uh, you know, um, go through. Because even if the power transition, uh, power transfer in Belarus begins in the nearest future, Russia will not just be the key stakeholder, it will probably be uh, the power that will defy, define some of the rules and terms of this power transfer. And this is the direct, you know, impairment to the country's sovereignty. Uh, and this is, again, the direct result of the absence or, or of the collapse of public trust resulting from authoritarian leadership. And that uh, was probably my main, my main point for, for, for now, that uh, authoritarian leadership in crisis can only aggravate the crisis rather than uh, help to, you know, yeah. uh, bring upon the solution. It's very interesting. Uh, can... Uh, can can you can hear, uh, can you hear me? Yes, it, it's really interesting what you say, and I wonder, I wonder if, uh, given Lu uh, Lukashenko's longevity in power, does this kind of authoritarian leadership, um, does it even have the 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 intellectual capacity to have a dialogue? since there was no need for a dialogue before negotiations and there was this kind of quasi social contract. Um, you, you mentioned Russia having the veto, but I find it really interesting that there isn't a, um, an iota of, of a dialogue or a wish to negotiate with any of the coordination council, even as a face saving element, even to, to maintain some semblance of, of sovereignty for Belarus before Putin has the veto. So my question is, you know, just this idea, can authoritarian leaders really negotiate if they are authoritarian, does not go against their philosophy? It's a very good question because the brief answer would be no. Um, because uh, Alexander Lukashenko in, is, I mean, he lives in the informational, you know, space in which he has the 80% of support. He does believe it. Um, he does believe these numbers, and that's the problem. Because it's one thing to became to behave dictatorially, but no, no, being aware that you are unpopular, it's completely another thing when you are under an illusion that you are still popular. And uh, he disregards uh, the legitimacy of the opponents. He mm. just believes that yeah. they represent not the majority of the society, but the minority. And why then to communicate with them? They're yeah. just criminals. Um, and that's basically the stance where we are now, right now. And I think for this to change, uh, Lukashenko needs to be weakened way more so that he cannot ignore the, just the reality of the ground that his vertic power vertical is collapsing and nobody listens to his orders. Only then he will probably think of negotiation just of sheer and pure uh, self-preservation instinct. Otherwise, I don't think that this is the kind of leader uh, and this is the kind of political system that has any even capacity to, to, to engage in dialogue with mm, people exactly. whom it continuously 
uh, described and perceived as just foreign puppets. And um, before we open up the discussion to the three of you, and particularly the role of Russia, Artem, a very quick question. Since the, the power structures are absolutely vertical, there's no horizontal uh, for the moment, what would what would break this vertical structure? Well, usually the, the history of such authoritarian regime collapse, uh, if histories of this collapses, uh, usually shows that, unfortunately, it's either the physical demise of the leader or uh, some way more brutal crackdown or blood that we've seen. And uh, I, I unfortunately, I don't, I'm not aware of examples where such vertical personalized authoritarian regimes have collapsed just, or the power structures have been, you know, cracking just because uh, of weeks of peaceful protests. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very unfortunate, you know, conclusion to come as a citizen of this country. Okay. But for, this has been a test case, basically. We've seen that during the seven weeks of the protests that, I, I mean, the numbers of it is just for Belarus unimaginable. Uh, I mean, just to translate it to Russia, it would mean a million people marching in Moscow every Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is probably even more than Maidan on its peak mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the number of people. But still the power structure is holding by and large, just some mm -hmm. defections from the mid-level. Mm -hmm. And this means that uh, in absence of any collective bodies, in absence of any clans, of any groups within the elites, of any parties, of any kind of politburos uh, of the system, of any oligarchy groups, when everything is ba is looking like a pyramid, basically, uh, there is no uh, elite ruling elite in its usual sense of the word. It is not a subject. Uh, it's just um, a conglomerate of individuals who makes decision on their personal cost and benefit analysis. And usually, uh, the risks are larger on the side of defecting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what you call a, 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 an, an optimistic scenario. It's a very important um, explanation you give us. I want to quickly jump into Ukraine and Georgia briefly and um, the, the power structure. Um, it, uh, it's what Artem mentioned, you know, if Russia has the veto, if Putin does want the veto, in some ways, if Putin put his own interests to heart, he, he may, maybe he could get an amenable leadership or transition leadership in Belarus, but that doesn't seem to be on the cards. Um, Katrina and uh, Kalili, how, 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 how worried are you? Or do you, does the whole Russia um, so-called veto uh, really worry you? And how does it affect your own kind of security in your own respective countries? Katrina first. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what exactly you mean by Russian veto, Judy. Uh, but if if I understand you, if we, you and me are on the same page, then I would say that Ukraine is trying to counter this Russian veto yes. throughout its history, and it has been particularly Indeed. acute in the last uh, uh, seven years, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I think that Ukraine is very well aware of uh, how much Russia can want it. The, to, to perform this veto, starting from the aftermath of the uh, revolution of the dignity. So, okay, the, the story everyone knows well, the occupation of the Crimea and the uh, right. aggression in the East. Uh, so but far, I, I can say that uh, definitely both Ukrainian presidents, uh, which uh, have been there since 2014, um, are, let's say, holding the punch. Uh, to various degrees. So President Zelensky, as we know, uh, is uh, yeah. trying. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Actually, I mean, I mean, the perception. I mean, how when Lukashenko went to Moscow and we, oh, Sochi rather, and we saw the body language and promise of money, etc. And I'm thinking of the Russian perception of Belarus now and how it might affect um, the Ukrainian stance. Might, might, might. Um, you know, Ukraine will have to take a stand sooner or later with Belarus. So I'm really looking at the Moscow-Minsk axis rather than even have problems as it is with, with Russia and Eastern Ukraine. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering how Ukraine sees this Russia this so-called veto over Belarus. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that, well, uh, the security strategy, which I mentioned, uh, said that Ukraine will pursue the pragmatic relations with Belarus. 
and I think this is the answer because it was published already after the, the start of the protest. Um, Ukraine has traditionally perceived um, Belarus and Lukashenko in particular as a uh, Russian ally who tries to play, to perform as an independent actor. So I think this is kind of the situation which Ukraine is used to. Um, and it is trying to uphold these pragmatic relations uh, to the best of its own interests. So maybe not letting Belarus to sink too much into the Russian orbit, but I'm not sure Ukraine has that much of the of yeah. power over Belarus, yeah. um, especially given, let's say, the, the aggressive stance which Belarusian authorities have taken upon Ukraine during the protests. Ukraine really had very little effect, if any, on the protests, but there, yeah. were, uh, there was criticism uh, and harsh co comments uh, coming from Belarus towards Ukraine authorities as if they tried to intrude or influence in any way. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Katrina. Cornelia, is you sitting in Tbilisi, I mean, both Ukraine and, and Georgia, you know, share, you have got contested statehood and contested orders because of Russia. And um, what's the perception in Georgia about um, it, the, the the possible Russian intentions in Belarus. Do you do you worry about it, or you've been through this before? You know, is there anything any any tangible advice or support you can give jo uh, you, uh, Belarus, or you, you're waiting to see how events events unfold? Um, of course, I think um, uh, this affects um, Georgia as well because, um, but Georgia is a very delicate situation because, as you know. After the recognition of South Ossetia and Abkhazia by Russia, uh, Belarus was the country actually who uh, never recognized it, even though there was a huge pressure on uh, Lukashenko's regime. So Georgia, through uh, international actors like EU and United States, managed to persuade him not to do so, which was, of course, unpleasant for Russian ruling regimes. And they st still, I think, were pressuring. So in this situation, Georgian government and political class I'm not really cannot really do much uh, directly. So, but uh, what what is important? The civil society is uh, supporting the, the changes in Belarus because, in um, if things goes well, um, in in uh, you know the best case scenario, uh, if there will be democratic transformation, Belarus could be something like. Uh, uh, Ukraine is now for Georgia. That's a very strategically important country, uh, you know, like uh, which uh, with, with whom we share a lot together with, um, uh, you know, Moldova. So, and strategic location and vicinity near uh, which uh, Belarus has has a lot of advantages if there will be, you know, like uh, this um, some sort of uh, transformation of the power, uh, which we don't know what will happen. As far as the Ra Russian Roberto power. I think uh, uh, Georgians already know this. What, uh, what, what, what does it mean? Because, as you know, uh, Russia lost the direct influence on Georgian politics after the 2008 war. They're trying now to change this dynamic, and they want to. They supporting uh, you know some pro-Russian groups and center-right groups in order to gain this support and especially to influence Georgian politics and directly the parliament. But um, uh, as far as the, um, uh, you know, the Georgia's, uh, how to say, um, accession towards the Atlantic space, I think that uh, uh, Russia is trying so far effectively uh, block the Georgia's NATO membership together with Ukraine, actually, uh, because they, they, they hold so-called uh, de facto uh, you know, veto power um, on these issues. And probably all of you know about this, and I'm not going to go into details how this is affects the in general regional security, yeah. but this is very essential uh, for Georgia. But but Cornelia and and Katrina and Artem, you know, on a, on a on a on a sub level, you know, we're getting into the big issue of resilience, societal resilience on the one hand, the resilience of the elites on the other, and and this contest actually being played out in all three countries in, in very different ways. I was wondering, um, I was wondering, could we? Have a brief look at the EU. I see that the the, the foreign policy chief uh, Josef Borrell is in Kiev today, which is which is very good actually that he's holding uh, high level meetings in, in Ukraine. But you know the, the European Union has this this neighbourhood policy, and they go on about resilience and so on. But um, do, has the European Union really a role to play um, in in? in strengthening human security, in moving away from the element of insecurity, which is very prevalent now in the region, if anybody wants to jump in here. 
the, the role of the, the European well, I, Union? I can, I can start because the role of the European mm-hmm. Union in, in, in Belarus is the the weakest uh, uh, comparing to that of uh, th- that in Georgia and Ukraine, I believe. Um, European Union has struggled to come up with a strategy vis-a-vis Belarus and it failed to do so. Uh, and I don't blame the EU. Belarus is relatively l- less important of a country for Bel- for the EU, uh, traditionally been so, because it never actually, you know, declared its pro-European or just European sentiment or plans to enter the EU or any, you know, intentions to even engage with the EU deeper. So there was it was hard for the EU policymakers to convince themselves to engage Belarus deeper despite its will. Uh, and uh, that was always the problem, but we saw how this problem manifests itself now, when during the time of the political crisis, not just that the EU struggles to adopt sanctions for like 40 days already, uh, it's the internal EU debate, but also the realization that the EU has virtually zero leverage in the country to affect any change, to uh, make any uh, meaningful uh, you know, policy change uh, to enforce any policy change by on the regime, because all the sanctions that are under discussion and even maybe under discussion will not change anything on the ground from the point of view of uh, Belarusian regime's behavior. We even got to the point when the Oppositional Coordination Council uh, basically refused to accept the EU financial support because uh, it does not want to get into this framing of the conflict as the EU versus Russia, yeah. because this is what the Belarusian regime wants to impose uh, on, on this conflict. Yes. So the EU, therefore, uh, has never become an influential actor on Belarusian domestic politics. And uh, it's, again, unfortunate for everyone, maybe except for Russia. Uh, but uh, that's where we are. And that, again, shows you that to have a leverage, you first have to have presence on the ground. And if you don't, I mean, economically, politically, diplomatically, uh, from the point of view of human diplomacy, if you just don't have it, you cannot hope to be a geopolitical actor in mm. vi- vis-a-vis this country. Uh, you either engage and grow out muscles of your presence, yeah. or you, you are just as relevant as, I don't know, Argentina, Japan, Australia, and other uh, world nations uh, w- with regards to the Belarusian domestic crisis. But Artem, to pick you up on this, um, Belarus, for the first time, for a long, long time, it's it's trying to begin the transformation. Uh, And we've seen in other Central and East European countries, especially in Bulgaria and Romania, it's unfinished transformation. So you have a situation in some EU member states, the transformation is unfinished. In Belarus, it's only beginning. Um, But... Um, how can it how can it uh, continue, given the huge uncertainty of Russia, um, the the mindset of of Lukashenko and the elites, and the extraordinary persistence of the, of the society? Something must give. True, but uh, it's a million euro or dollar question, to be honest, because um, I I'm not, I don't I honestly don't foresee any any progress in this direction with Lukashenko in power. And so we must first speak of his Oster, his removal, and then what will be the configuration of powers in Belarus that would probably lead to this transformation that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And even in this framework, the EU is less of a factor than in transformations of all the nations that you've mentioned, because the EU ceased to be this magnet uh, that provided this direction of transformation for, let's say, Baltic states that, yes. for example, I gave them the motivation to suffer for some years because they had this, you know, shining uh, uh, aim on the horizon. We are going to the EU integration. So it, it was, uh, you know, suffering for some years, for example, of, 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 of increased mm-hmm. gas prices and so on and so forth. The same yeah. is Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine suffered greatly for its European intentions and the desire to be Europeanized, so to say. However, in Belarus, again, if you look at the protests, there is zero EU flags there. There are some, there are some Russian flags from the Russian democratic activists. There are some, uh, I know, many Belarusian flags. Uh, There are some Israeli flags, I don't know, but there are no (laughs) EU flags at all. Well, Well, it's interesting in Armenia, there were no EU flags either. 
and look how how Armenia has has come out of this crisis. Uh, let's go to Georgia. Um, the EU is is uh, Cornelia briefly. Is the EU still the shining? Is this the magnet still, or has the have the Georgians become more realistic, or more sanguine, or more disappointed, or 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 or, or, or do you realize we have to go our own way and prepare ourselves? I think both probably because uh, EU, of course, is visible in Ukraine and Georgia for obvious reasons, especially after 2008 war. We have a EU MM mission and we have also some other EU offices here. So uh, EU is very active in Georgia and there's a, um, how to say, public opinion also supports very highly. And we have more than 80% of the people actually supporting EU integration. So that's a high number for already like decades. But what is missing here and what, is, what the people actually expect that, of course, we hear lot of things about resilience from EU and the United States and some other international actors, but sometimes it seems like that you have to care about yourself. And I think it doesn't work in the uh, case of weak states like Georgia. It means that you can also a little bit help, like especially in terms of social resilience and uh, societal res resilience. And I think they doing, they started to do something, but sometimes it's not clear if they know exactly what uh, the countries like, um, uh, you know, the frontline states like Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, they really need. And of course, they support the civil society, which is very important. But sometimes I think what we need is what, what is needed is some sort of, uh, you know, like clear strategy, how to deal with the misinformation and propaganda, which comes from Russia, and also how to build our own societal resilience through the help. Because uh, we have some basics uh, level of this resilience on the societal level, but I think we need to a little bit um, strengthen that. And EU is the actor who actually can do it uh, if uh, they will have, if they will come with uh, concrete, uh, uh, how to say, vision about how to deal with these issues. I, I, I'm glad you're a great fan of the EU because when you're sitting in, in, in inside Europe, sometimes one gets very frustrated over all sorts of issues, um, the things we can't agree on. And I want to go to, to Ukraine because, Katarina, we touched on the on the the beginning of transformation, the unfinished transformations, and um, it's it's an issue I want to go return to. Um, Ukraine is is has embarked on this transformation i'm not going to ask how long will it take but is the transformation being slowly consolidated i'd like to start out with the um the previous question about the EU role uh, in Ukraine, because I, I think that this is actually a, a grand question right now on for you ukraine relations uh, very briefly if we look at the dimension of relations we can say that um I don't think that the EU is perceived as a security actor, if especially in the meaning of high security, sure. um, and not on the public level. Then there is still, as in Georgia, there is support for the European integration on the ground among the society, but the EU-Ukraine relations are currently lacking a grand vision. And this is a, a debate which is going on and maybe has not yet um, borne a significant fruit, neither in Ukraine nor the EU, what could the next big step be in the EU-Ukraine relations after the uh, association agreement um, was signed and while we are not talking strictly about the membership perspective. Um, currently we have a paradox uh, with the, in the EU-Ukraine relation that on the one hand uh, in opinion polls uh, the public repeatedly uh, says that uh, it uh, expects leverage on the Ukrainian authorities and uh, not money. Uh, because money will be stolen or whatever. Uh, so there is no trust as to, to the institutions in dealing with money. But what we see, as in the case, for example, with the specialized anti-corruption prosecutor, which you mentioned uh, just, uh, this is just the case of the recent days, that it is exactly the fear of losing the EU aid and investment and Western overall aid and investment that actually it works. So on the one hand, there is um, society does not expect money from the EU, but on the other hand, it is actually this money issue which works when we speak about yes. language. <laughs> yes. So if we are talking about consolidation, um, you know, Judy, um, I think anti-corruption is actually a good case in point because the kind of the dialogue which we've seen uh, last week about Ukraine making a wrong step as and consciously wrong step in anti-corruption sphere uh, and the EU criticizing it. 
it's been the situation which I remember for as long as I follow Ukraine relations. So that's a long time. <laughs> Uh, and um, I kind of see these small steps ahead, which Ukraine does, and which actually maybe accumulate to a certain success. So Ukraine of 2010 is obviously a different Ukraine than it was, I don't know, 10 years ago. But whether we are closer to stability and rule of law, I really don't know. Yeah. I'm aware I'm of saying, you know, definitely yes. Mm. It's it's very complicated, uh, this issue of the rule of law. Um, I mean, it's weak in some of the EU member states. And the member states aren't taken to task, actually, for many, many reasons. And rule of law is a, is a political cultural aspect of accountability, of transparency, of the division of powers. But, um, Katrini, you mentioned um, the idea of leverage. The EU has leverage. We saw the visa-free issue, uh, the IMF uh, loans and so on. Um, there's a bit of leverage in Georgia. I'm not so sure how much, Cornelia, but there's some. But as Artem says, there is no leverage in Belarus. So where does this leave Belarus? Artem. Well, uh, in a way, I... I try to be optimistic about this because it means that when and if the rule of law uh, will become, it will be built in Belarus, it will be sort of more grassroots, organically grown product of the society itself. And it will be uh, only built because it was pre prior to that demanded by the society, but not uh, imported from, yeah. uh, from the EU, let's say, or, or any other Western uh, partner. At the same time, it's hard to ignore uh, the realities that the transition to the rule of law based governance in the Eastern, Eastern European countries have usually been accumulated with uh, the or, or, you know, coupled with the support, financial support of the Western institutions, financial institutions, and that smoothed the way towards this, uh, you know, building of this resilient uh, rule of law based uh, states. And I, I doubt whether without this, Belarus can, can, can you know, again, remain resilient on, on the way, because this is a hard process. This is not, uh, this is a transformational, as, as you rightly said, this is not just a political process, a cultural process as well. And for the government to be able to, in a way, recode uh, yeah. the whole, yeah. uh, you know, philosophy of state, it needs to have, uh, the firm credit of trust and the firm, uh, you know, uh, yeah. financial backing, um, to be perfectly honest with you. And if the government is financially weak, dependent on the Russian, Russian goodwill, uh, it is not usually the kind of government that performs this civilizational kind of uh, transformation. Um, on it, to take you up on, on, well, to bring in the issue, because um, the EU, the leaders are going to discuss this issue yeah, on Thursday. Should sanctions be imposed? In case of Belarus? Yeah. Well, it's a very difficult question to ask for, for, from a Belarusian, because as I've said, they don't matter in terms of Belarusian okay. domestic politics. The yeah. EU, EU sanctions are basically imposed for the sake of the domestic consumptions, consumption yeah. in the EU, just to you know, uh, demonstrate the moral high ground and that we will not accept people who are responsible for torture and vote rigging and uh, uh, other kind of violations of the law. We will just not accept them, not, not allow them to travel to the EU. So this is more of a moral act than the political yeah. act. And therefore, it's up to the EU to decide what kind of moral signals it needs to send to its own populations and, you know, peoples. Uh, with the Belarus, again, it, it has so little effect that it's hard for me to even, uh, mm -hmm. you know, put a good or bad sign on it. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, um, whether or not, I, I, I take a point, the moral ethical issue and this, oh, it's shocking what's happening. And it is shocking what's happening to, to brave people who take to the streets on a Sunday. I mean, it's something that um, it's not done anymore in, in, in Europe because we have stability and the, the, the rule of law. But I, I'm just looking at the map and you see Ukraine, you see Georgia, you see Belarus, you see Moldova. 
uh, you see Russia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, you have this extraordinary picture and it's, it's on our border. And sometimes I think the, the potential for enormous instability is huge. And, um, and it, it's worrying because sometimes when we sit in the, the so-called West, that's Europe, we have this um, comfort zone. There's our comfort zone and there's, there's a zone out there which really isn't comfort, but it hasn't invaded us yet. And I was wondering, you know, how long, how long can this kind of stability last in, in Belarus? And it is a, it's very fragile. And on the other hand, you know, how long uh, can Georgia and Ukraine continue with this transformative process um, without, without, um, without a long-term perspective of being integrated with going home to Europe in some ways? It's a very complicated question. I think it's just uh, in case of Belarus, it's it's it, it's meaningless to make predictions these days yeah. because the situation is very very volatile. Uh, I think that Belarus has come probably the closest in its recent history to this brink, after which it becomes the donor of instability, uh, after which it may actually become a headache for the EU, like Ukraine and Georgia became at some points in their recent history. Uh, however given that Belarus does not have the kinds of internal divisions in the society, geographic divisions, um, other kinds of, you know, ethnic or re religious, you know, divisions that can be exploited by the foreign power, a big yeah. elephant in the room here to create this new point of instability for Europe. Um, it's hard for me to see the immediate way of Belarus becoming this, you know, burning problem for the EU, mm. but again, Never before we has been in, we have been in such a volatile situation. So I would not uh, give any you know guarantees here. No, 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 and I I I wouldn't press you on it either. But um, it, it is so vulnerable. But the three of you, directly or indirectly, have brought up the idea of trust. Um, in it. Cornelia, the, the level of trust, I'm not talking about the EU level or the trust in NATO, um, the level of of the citizens' trust in the elites and the government. How strong is it um, to such an extent that it has a stabilizing factor and a resilient one at that point? Uh, unfortunately, um, that's a little bit difficult question because if you see the um, polls here, recent polls, actually trust towards the governmental institution is going down and most the highest uh, approval has the Georgian church, Orthodox church. Yes. And uh, even though there was some, uh, you know, some um, problems in the inside the church, uh, it's still, uh, you know, the patriarch himself enjoys quite uh, high popularity. And uh, if you look to other uh, state institutions like uh, certain ministries and uh, even prosecutor's office and judiciary, especially, yeah. it enjoys very low approval. So I think that's uh, also kind of a huge problem for uh, for country uh, like Georgia, um, who actually is not a consolidated democracy, it's just aspiring democracy. And we, um, I think, you know, the consolidated democracy, we need a little bit uh, uh, change uh, internally, as well as, uh, of course, public trust is very important. And I think there's a lot of things which should be done. There's a, also a room for improvement. And I just also wanted to give a few comments about this. Uh, you know, like uh, use uh, how you see uses the uh, you know like the neighborhood, especially our region, because so far what uh, what we see is that unfortunately there is no strategic vision from EU side regarding Eastern Partnership, and it is just considered kind of a land between Russia and EU um, yeah. or like signed. And for instance, countries like Georgia, Ukraine, and uh, Moldova seem like security orphans or gray zone, and these kind of you know names already telling you there is no no vision behind of this, but what is needed, and uh, I know maybe it's not realistic right now, we, we understand what's going on now internally in the EU, but 
what these three countries, especially associated country, Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, we need yeah. to, we understand that there might not be, you know, like the a membership yeah. issue might not be realistic right now, but what they need is strategic messaging from the West, yeah. including EU and um, uh, in the United States, which is lacking a bit because, yeah. um, you know, there's also a question now, if we have this United West, and Judy, you started this, um, uh, that you brought this idea of the West, but do we have this West? Because there's no. a tension transatlantic relations so but in this region is suffers from this uh, uh you know without strategic messaging and i think this is very important to to bring this uh, kind of common uh, messaging to the regions well Colleen, i think the west is a bit of a misnomer at the moment and um, i want to go to um to katrina about the the issue of trust and it, the trust is just so fundamental for the messaging for making decisions for dealing with the pandemic for resilience, for, for stability. Um, the level of trust at the moment, um, can, you, can, you, can you qualify it, uh, Katrina, at the moment in Ukraine? Yes, uh, this is a very silent question uh, in Ukrainian context. As in uh, many other Eastern European countries outside of the EU, I would say that Ukraine's natural state is low trust towards the government. Uh, what we had last year was a, an outlier case. <laughs> And now we are going back to normal, so to say, because uh, I mentioned the level uh, of uh, the assessment of whether things are going in the right direction, trust towards the president is also dropping. Uh, so currently we have more people who do not trust the president or rather do not approve of, of his uh, uh, actions. Yeah, and I think this can be related. Uh, I think that uh, for Ukraine, actually low trust of the institutions is a consolidating factor for civil society. Mm. We can measure civil society in very, in very um, different terms. Uh, depending on how we define civil society, I would say it constitutes from uh, 10 to 30 percent, depending on how you ask the question, how you formulate the question. But it is, uh, let's say, 20, one, one fifth of society. But this is very, um, very important. For example, in the case uh, of today's uh, pandemic crisis, I think the civil society, uh, people who used to volunteer some years ago or volunteering now are gearing up for a hard winter. And maybe this is a good thing, uh, a rather better thing than if there were high hopes for the institutions which would prove to be weak, which would prove to be weak again. And yeah. this is likely to be the case. And as for the EU-Ukraine relations and, and trust and um, um, and this, you ask how, how long Ukraine can remain more or less stable given the uh, maybe lack of uh, perspective, not membership, yeah. but a perspective of development, yeah. developing relations. I would say that maybe uh, the capital, this, this trust capital, social capital, which Ukraine and the EU now have, uh, actually depends on Ukraine's civil society too. No, yeah. civil, just rather broad society and yeah. societal demand for EU integration. Once it is out, yeah. You have really little. Can't put it back in the bottle. Thank you, Katrina, for this. The last word for our team, and it's not an easy one. Um, the social contract is is broken in your country. Um, whether it was artificial or whether it was a, it was a special kind of social contract. The level of trust. I mean, what trust is there now? Um, and you have this extraordinary uh, separation. The the. The, 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 the intact vertical uh, versus the horizontal and the grassroots. Um, it's, a, it's a very difficult question. What, what, will, what will bring the horizontal, what, what will break this deadlock? Uh, since there's no trust anymore and society has its own dynamics at the moment, what, where will it give? Well, I'd say that usually yeah, yeah okay uh, our, our region has a, a recipe for getting out of this deadlock which is called the round table uh and the round table for this to come you don't just need uh, some initial level of trust yeah. you also need the willingness to speak absolutely and if the horizontal structures of civil society and the coordination council have declared it's its willingness to discuss the transition of power, the future of the country, yeah. I mean, whatnot, uh, the other side refuses to engage even in dialogue. Yeah. If we are in the position when the other side, the authorities somehow, you know, grow into the willingness to, to speak, yeah. then two sides will need to overcome their crisis of trust. And that usually in the international, you know, negotiations into the domestic uh, negotiations, it's usually done via the some 
uh, confidence building measures, yes. some mutual concessions, yes. then pick, pick in some mediators, and maybe then uh, embarking on the agenda and how we can get to some more or less, uh, you know, peaceful resolution. Yeah. However, I don't think that this is the likeliest, you know, scenario in, in current Belarusian uh, situation. It's really interesting you, you say this, Artem, because it took so long for the Polish Communist Party to come round to the, it's not really a round table, by the way, but it's still there in the, in the, in the, in the, yeah, but it, it, the presidential it took, year, it, it took, it took years, it took, there. it took strikes, it took Absolutely. emergency situation. It took a long, it took, long time, yeah. but they came to it. That would, that's a great, um, that's, there's a little, little glimmer of optimism with the idea of a big round table. And um, I've got to thank the three of you. It's been a great, a great session. Cornelia Katia from Tbilisi, Georgia, Katarina Zorambo from Kiev, and Artem Shraban from Minsk, Belarus. Thank you very much. This was um, a, a, a terrific um, insight into what's going on. And this was part of our EU Horizon 2020 uh, forum dedicated to the Eastern neighborhood. Uh, the best of health, keep safe, and thank you very, very much, all of you. Thank you.